Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak, despite Tokyo lobbying against it, a US state bill on the dual naming for the body of water between Korea and Japan passes the State House Committee. The bill now heads to the full House Assembly. The two Koreas agreed to discuss resuming reunions for families separated since the Korean War on Wednesday. Seoul wants the family meetings before its annual military drills with Washington at the end of the month, but Pyongyang may think otherwise. Plus, the US Treasury Secretary warns Congress it will need to move right away to increase the debt limit to avoid a default by the end of the month. Daybreak begins now. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Daybreak on Tuesday, February 4th. I'm Chi Yusan in Seoul. The U.S. state of Virginia has taken another step toward ensuring students learn about the Korean name East Sea, as well as the Japanese name Sea of Japan for the body of water between the two countries. The Virginia House Education Committee passed a bill which requires school texts in the state to use both names by a majority of 18 to 3 on Monday. The bill now heads to the full House on Thursday, where it is widely expected to win approval. A similar bill has already passed the state Senate. Korea argues the Japanese name for the sea reflects Japan's imperialistic aggressions. Despite Tokyo's campaign to block the bill's passing, Seoul-based Yonhap News reports Virginia state governor Terry McAuliffe has said he intends to sign the bill once it passes the full assembly. After exchanging messages back and forth on Monday, the two Koreas agreed to meet on Wednesday this week to discuss arranging inter-Korean family reunions later this month. Our Hwang Sung-hee has more. Breaking its week-long silence, North Korea proposed on Monday morning that the two Koreas meet for Red Cross talks on either Wednesday or Thursday to discuss resuming the long-suspended reunions for families divided by the Korean War. Shortly after, South Korea accepted the proposal, calling for talks on Wednesday at the Truce Village of Panmunjom. At the meeting, the two sides will decide when and where the reunions will take place. South Korea had previously proposed holding the event from February 17th to the 22nd at North Korea's Mount Gyeonggang Resort. But since it takes roughly two weeks to prepare for such an event, the Koreas are up against the clock. Nonetheless, Seoul's unification ministry prefers sooner rather than later. The exact date must be discussed with North Korea, the working level talks, but the South Korean government will try to have the family reunions held as soon as possible, considering the urgency of the matter. The upcoming joint military exercises between South Korea and the United States, scheduled to begin late this month, could also push back the reunions. Seoul and Washington say the annual drills involving thousands of troops are purely defensive in nature, but Pyongyang views them as a war game. Experts say the North could make a counterproposal on the reunion dates that would have the event taking place after the key resolve and full eagle exercises, which end in April, or even walk away. They will always can say they were nice, they wanted family reunions, they wanted better relations, but the South Koreans, as usual, again showed their aggressive nature. South Korea had earlier said that the reunion dates could be changed upon North Korea's request if it was for justifiable reasons. But because North Korea has a history of walking out of its agreements, the elderly family members waiting to reunite for the first time in more than six decades will likely have their fingers crossed until the day they see their loved ones again. Hwang Sung-hee, Arirang News. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is expected to visit Seoul later this month, with North Korea likely to be high on his agenda. The South Korean government is also pushing to use his, uh, this opportunity to have President Obama pay a visit as well. Our Kim ji has more. 
U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is reportedly planning a visit to South Korea later this month to discuss security issues on the Korean Peninsula and ways to deal with potential provocations from North Korea. At a security forum in Munich on Saturday, Kerry announced his plans to visit China in two weeks to work on the North Korean issue. South Korean government sources say the U.S. top diplomat is likely to pay a visit to Seoul before or after his trip to Beijing. That would put Kerry in Seoul sometime during the third week of this month, right before the joint South Korea-U.S. key resolve military exercises are scheduled to start in Korea. Could his trip be followed up by a visit from U.S. President Barack Obama a couple months later? Citing U.S. and Japanese officials, the Yomiuri Shimba reports that President Obama will be making stops in Japan, the Philippines and Malaysia during a tour of the region in April. He is reportedly considering a visit to Seoul as well. Obama and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe are expected to discuss a wide range of issues, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the territorial disputes with China and Japan and the denuclearization of North Korea. President Obama had to cancel his trip to Southeast Asia in October due to the federal shutdown in the United States. Kim ji Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye has nominated first Vice Foreign Minister Kim Gyu-hyun as the head of the recently revived National Security Council Secretariat. Kim, a veteran diplomat, has served as a deputy chief mission to the United States and the deputy foreign minister. The presidential office of Cheung Wade says his leadership, as well as his negotiation and crisis management skills, were the main reasons behind the president's decision. The NSC secretariat was shut down by the Lee Myung Bak administration back in 2008. President Bak ordered that it be re-established in December in consideration of the growing threats from North Korea and escalating tensions in Northeast Asia. Over now to a high-profile treason trial. Prosecutors have sought a 20-year prison term for a leftist lawmaker, Lee Seok Gi, accused of plotting to overthrow the Korean government. Our Park ji has this report. At the Suwon District Court on Monday, prosecutors requested a 20-year prison term for left-wing lawmaker Lee Seok Gi who stands accused of conspiring to stage a revolt in the event of an inner Korean war. Prosecutors also demanded that the 52-year-old lawmaker be stripped of his voting rights and be restricted from holding public office for 10 years after his release from prison. Prosecutors say the severe punishment befits the crime, as Lee had previously been arrested and prosecuted for a similar offense back in 2002. They added that Lee has shown no remorse for his actions and that he attempted to destroy the basic democratic order of South Korea in violation of constitutional law. Lee is currently standing trial on charges of leading a pro-North Korea group called the Revolutionary Organization. The underground group was allegedly plotting to overthrow the government by plotting to sabotage the South Korean government and U.S. troops in the event of an inner Korean war. In addition to Lee, prosecutors are seeking 10 to 15-year prison terms for six other unified Progressive Party members who were indicted on the same charges. Lee has consistently denied the insurrection charges against them. A final verdict in his trial is scheduled to come by the 17th of this month at the latest. Observers say the ruling is likely to greatly influence the Constitutional Court's ruling on whether the leftist unified progressive party should be disbanded. The National Assembly is also currently reviewing a motion that calls for Lee seok to be removed from his parliamentary seat. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, okay, to return to the negotiation. President Park Geun Hye plans, given the current circumstances, on your way to work so or at home, Defense Ministry, the legislature will convene a. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV.
The summer months are the peak time for travel here in Korea. And in an attempt to create more tourism hotspots in the country, the government unveiled more tourism promotion measures on Monday. Our Oh Jin Ju has this report. If the government's first set of tourism promotion measures in July was focused on bringing foreign tourists to Korea, a second batch of measures unveiled Monday is aimed at enhancing domestic tourism. The government laid out its plans in a meeting presided over by President Park Geun-hye on Monday. One part of the plan involves the establishment of so-called tourism weeks in spring and fall to more evenly distribute the nation's tourism demand, which currently peaks in the summer. The designation will cover a total of 22 days from May 1st to the 11th and September 25th to October 5th. The Tourism Ministry and the Education Ministry are considering whether to close elementary, middle and high schools for short vacations during these periods. Also starting this year, the government will select three tourist cities of the year. Each of the three cities will be provided with as much as $2.3 million over a three-year period. President Peck described tourism as a goose that lays golden eggs and pledged to include tourism as the key sector in her three-year plan for economic innovation. She called for world-class policies that are in line with the public's rising standards and those that bring out the unique characteristics of each region. Koreans spend around $23 billion a year on domestic tourism, triggering more than $36 billion in production and creating some 5 million jobs. President Peck emphasized that should domestic tourism increase by 10 percent above that, the effect would be enormous. A notable thing at Monday's meeting was the president was joined by the secretary general of the U.N. World Tourism Organization, Taleb Rafai. President Beck also highlighted the importance of nurturing students in vocational high schools for the tourism industry, benchmarking Switzerland's advanced vocational training system, saying it will raise the nation's youth employment level and help meet the demands for employees in the sector. Oh Jin Shu, Adrian News. Turning now to the latest on the bird flu crisis gripping the nation. Authorities say two wild ducks suspected of an avian influenza infection were found dead in Korea's northeastern Gangwon-do province. A provincial official says if the case is confirmed to be of a bird flu infection, a travel ban on poultry in the region may be enforced. In the central Chungcheongbuk-do province, a third farm was confirmed to have been infected with a highly pathogenic H5N8 strain of the virus. Forty farms have been contaminated with the virus so far, and at least 2.6 million ducks and chickens have been culled. The U.S. Treasury Secretary says the United States may default if Congress does not raise the borrowing limit before the end of the month. Speaking in Washington Monday, Jack Lew said the Treasury would have to rely on emergency measures to pay the country's debts after the 16.7 trillion U.S. dollar limit is reinstated on Friday. Lew said his department could resort to accounting mechanisms to avoid breaching the limit until the end of February. But he went on to say the new reserves will be sucked dry quickly as the Treasury Department issues annual income tax refunds. And also on Monday, Janet Yellen was sworn in as the first chairwoman of the U.S. Federal Reserve. She will deliver her first testimony to House and Senate committees next week. Anti-government protesters in Thailand have pledged to organize larger street demonstrations in an effort to overturn the results of a general election that was first designed to quell the unrest. Protests against Prime Minister Yingna Shinawad disrupted the voting process in certain regions on Sunday, keeping millions of people from casting their ballots. For those that weren't able to vote, the government said it would hold a second round of polls. Protesters are demanding the prime minister step down and there be an establishment of an un unelected people's council to bring a major political reform. 
The embattled president of Ukraine returned to work on Monday after four days of sick leave, but the situation on the streets remains very much the same as when he left. Thousands of protesters filled Kiev's main square on Monday, calling for President Viktor Yanukovych to resign. Opposition leaders addressed the crowd after a meeting with European and U.S. officials and said they hoped for an international mediation in negotiations with the government, along with constitutional changes that would limit the president's power. Yanukovych angered opponents in November when he spurned a trade pact with the European Union and turned instead to Russia for financial support. South Africa's late former president Nelson Mandela left an estate worth 4.1 million U.S. dollars, according to the reading of his will on Monday. Family members, the ruling African National Congress, former staff and several local schools will benefit from the estate that he left behind. The estate includes an upscale house in Johannesburg, a dwelling in his rural Eastern Cape home province, and royalties from book sales, including his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom. Mandela died in December of last year, aged 95. The Korean government is calling on smartphone makers and local telecom carriers to address the surging number of applications that come pre-installed on mobile devices. And in order to cut down on the clutter, the mobile industry will soon have to give users the freedom to choose which apps they want to delete. Our Polly reports. Today's newest smartphones boast more features and functions than ever before. But they're often weighed down by dozens of preloaded applications, many of which can't even be deleted. These default apps are typically pre installed on smartphones by hardware manufacturers, mobile carriers, and sponsored software developers. But the Korean government says enough is enough. The Ministry of Science, ICT, and Future Planning recently announced new guidelines that take aim at the so called digital bloatware which they say takes up valuable space and hinders fair market competition. For example, the ministry found that a total of 80 default apps were installed on Samsung's Galaxy F smartphone released by SK Telecom. Under the new guidelines, companies such as Samsung and LG Electronics will be forced to cut more than half of their pre-installed apps. Officials say the move is the first of its kind among global communications regulators. Users will have the option of whether to use pre-installed applications. In addition, we've laid out guidelines to ensure information is disclosed regarding these pre-loaded smartphone apps. The measures, according to the ministry, are in response to the majority of people who are fed up with unwanted apps being forced upon them. In a survey of more than 1,000 smartphone users in Korea, 67 percent of respondents said they had tried to delete applications that came pre-installed on their mobile devices. In addition, more than half of those surveyed expressed complaints over the inability to delete these defaults. The regulatory guidelines will go into effect in April, but will only cover newly launched devices. The ministry added that it plans to continue talks with mobile industry leaders and also track the effectiveness of the new policies. Paul Yi, Arirang News. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off with Super Bowl 48, which took place at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey. Now, the temperatures were a lot warmer than people thought it would be, but the final score shocked fans more than anything. Now, it became one of the most lopsided Super Bowl victory in NFL history. The Seattle Seahawks scored against the Denver Broncos in every way possible as they claimed their first Super Bowl title with a 43-8 victory. 
Not only was it their first title, it was also the first time such score came out in the Super Bowl as Seattle's Malcolm Smith became the third linebacker to win the Super Bowl MVP after intercepting Peyton Manning for a 69-yard touchdown and a fumble recovery. Now, back in the state, Super Bowl Sundays usually call for parties amongst friends and families, but a lot of people also bet on the games as well. But the big question after Sunday is, did Floyd Mayweather bet over $10 million on the Denver Broncos? Well, according to several Las Vegas bookies, the undefeated boxer allegedly placed $10.4 million on the Denver Broncos to win the Super Bowl. Although some of Mayweather's acquaintances claim that the rumors are untrue, the boxer is known to be a big money gambler. Now, nicknamed Money Mayweather, he topped Forbes' list of highest-paid athletes in 2012 and Sports Illustrated's earning list in 2013. And speaking of high-profile athletes, only if you're Kim Hyun ah do you garner so much attention on something so simple like the official Sochi athletes profile page. With the official Sochi profile page for the athletes updated, fans here in the nations looked up figure skater Kim Hyun ah and were pretty shocked that she was only "quote unquote" 165 centimeters tall. The profile also lists surfing on the internet as her favorite hobby and names Michelle Kwan as her hero. Now, the official profile includes detailed info about each athlete participating in the Sochi Winter Games. And finishing things off, while all the fans here in the nation were interested in Kim Yana's latest Olympic profile, fans in Japan had their eyes on a four-part special on Asada Mao that Nikon Sports wrote to commemorate the 2014 Sochi Winter Games. And while these series included reasons for why the 24-year-old Japanese figure skater is set to retire after the Olympics, many fans were surprised to find out that she will not be pulling off her famous triple axel during this year's Olympics. And according to the report, they felt that she can actually get more points without the triple axel, as they added that they found the secrets to why Kim Yuna outscores Asada Mao. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Izzy Han with your latest weather forecast. Well, temperatures plummet overnight to freezing side and bitter cold snap will grip the country throughout the day across the nation. Well, here in Seoul, we are waking up to freeze temperature at minus 10, but wind chill factor is down below minus 20 this morning here in the capital area. So it's super cold and afternoon highs are expected to 4 to 5 degrees lower than yesterday. In in fact, cold wave advisor has been issued across the much of the country, so be sure to bundle up tight today before heading out, and it looks like we'll have mostly sunny skies throughout the day. Well, uh, but the below freezing temperatures are expected to carry on to Wednesday, so please stay bundled up, and temperatures should start to ease up on Thursday afternoon, jumping to positive side, but again, it's freezing cold today, so let's take a closer look at those readings. The morning low in Seoul is at minus 10 and will only get up to minus 5. And Taegu and Gwangju should wake up to low of minus 7 and see a high of 1 and minus 1 respectively, while Busan wakes up to low of minus 5 this morning. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju will climb up to 2 in the afternoon. Daejeon will get up to minus 3, while the top temperature on Mount Kungang will be at minus 11. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. Please stay warm everyone and hope you have a wonderful day.
And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Thank you for being with us.